Hello, everyone. I've got Chris Berg with me. Chris is the president and founder of Data Kitchen, a data ops vendor that has uh, been out there for four years and has evangelized this space. So I thought it'd be great for him to show everyone what data ops is all about. So Chris, welcome and take it from here. All right, thanks, Wayne. So um, what am I gonna show in the demo? Well, this is gonna be a two-part demo. The first part is how do you not learn about data quality issues from your customers? And, and here the demo is really a, a meant to imitate a SQL Server data warehouse environment, where there's a dev environment and a production and a UAT. And then the second part of the demo is how do you not break production when you deploy changes? And this is gonna be more of a talking about sandboxes and, and in the cloud. Um, so I'm gonna just jump into our product right now. And if I can do that. So uh, this is Data Kitchen's product. It's a web-based product, has a command line, has a REST API. And like a lot of products, we have a, a set of abstractions. The first really important abstraction is, is a recipe. And recipe is that thing that talks to a bunch of uh, different technologies to orchestrate all the pieces uh, with uh, tests and monitors built in. And then the result of running that recipe is an order. And you do that in the kitchen. We'll talk about that in, in a minute. And so what's a recipe? Um, if I go in and look at a specific recipe, I've got one that uh, updates a data warehouse. It's called production update schedule. And this has got four steps in. And so looking at this, there's four steps. And, and this, uh, the first step is kind of running something in a Windows server, fixing it in Python and in a, a, a server, then loading the data with SSIS and then checking the data in SQL server. And our perspective is a lot of analytic work is this sort of, sets of different tools that need to be orchestrated. And when we run these, we want to, you know, thinking of it like a factory, since this is scheduled to run uh, every day, I want to go look at what the result of running it is. And the result of running it is something called an order. And so if we look at the UI that comes up, why, why would an orchestration tool have all these charts and graphs? Well, we think that um, like you know, Toyota was able to build a better car than, you know, GM or Ford in the 70s and 80s because they had lean production, total quality management, they studied Deming. We think the same ideas need to happen in analytics. You need to think about your analytic processes as an assembly line. You need to instrument that assembly line with tests or monitors. And then in this example, we've got every time we've run, we're getting a set of data about your analytic processing that we can use to judge whether the data is good or not because you in, in a lot of ways you need to uh, protect your production from your data sources because they can break columns can happen um, and things can happen and things can go and so this idea of statistical process control is important and uh, if I go back to my recipe um, you know we can or orchestrate all these pieces but sometimes I can go in and just uh, I have it running every day. Sometimes I'll get a request from my customer to, to run it now. And, and to do that, we create something called an order. I'm not going to do that now. I'll show you the result of running an order and, and why that's important. Um, and so this order that I ran actually uh, has an error in it. And this happens all the time. You, you get some bad data, some error happens, and, and we see this little red star here. And why did that happen? Well, I look at my test results um, and I see that I've got this task called check raw, count raw orders happen. And so our, those nodes in the, in the graph that we show are actually calling different technologies and being able to actually execute against the system. Um, and so they execute against the database, they execute against the ETL tool, um, and you'll see in the next part of the demo tableau. But the, the idea of these, these tests or monitors, um, checking your system and monitoring it, both from a statistical process control, but also just from an, an error recovery and finding your errors is, a, is an important thing. And, and these tests actually uh, have, have value uh, in the next part of our demo. So I'm gonna jump uh, into some slides that talk about that. So. You know, we talked a little bit about how I don't want to learn about data quality issues from my customer. The, the second part is, you know, how do I not break production when I when I deploy my changes? So uh, let me describe the scenario that I'm going to go through in the demo. So there's a, a VP of marketing. You know, that they, they've got a data engineer and a data analyst supporting them. 
Um, and they've got a production environment where the, the data is stored in Redshift. The actual data transformation work is done in Pentaho. The visualization is done in Tableau, and it's reported in Tableau Online. And in this demo, you're going to see Pentaho, you're going to see Tableau Online, but it doesn't matter for our technology. It could be Informatica or Talent or Raw SQL or Tableau or ClickView or a combination thereof. Um, and so uh, that VP of marketing asked that team, hey, I want a customer segmentation tomorrow. Can you, can you do that? And so for many years, when I managed analytics teams, I would have conversations with business customers saying, featured time quality, pick two, you can't get three. And so I've, I, I've realized that those VP of marketings need to operate at the speed of business. And they, and they want to live in a world where there's data-driven insight that helps their decisions and it's not gut. And so uh, teams have to find some way to be able to uh, have features, time, and quality all happen quickly. And so it gets further compounded because in order to do a segmentation in this demo, you need to have a new person called a data scientist join in. And they actually have a new tool. In this case, it's Jupyter. It could be R or SAS or, or, or whatever. And there actually has to be a change to the database schema. There has to be two columns added. One is a profitability column. Another one is the actual uh, batch segment itself. There needs to be a new visualization to Tableau. And they need a place to work safely that's not production. Um, and so in the demo, we're going to show you um, a place to, that people work that's called a kitchen. And uh, the data scientist, data engineer, and data analyst work in that kitchen. Um, it's got representative data. It's got a separate hardware environment. Um, and once they've done all their work um, they, and they are sure that it works, they can then deploy it into production and they can merge it uh, back into the production line. And so we'll show that in the demo. So uh, I'm gonna go back to our application here and I'm gonna switch our kitchens because we were working in the other one, this warehouse production. I'm actually gonna go to a different kitchen and that's a place where we work for the other demo. And that this kitchen is called production. And so in production, there's a different recipe that's running. Uh, this one is called uh, Agile Analytic Operations and it's got four steps this time. And these four steps do different things. So they've got one calls uh, Pentaho, one calls uh, 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 Tableau, or actually uh, puts the Tableau workbook into Tableau online and then does tests. So what does a calling Pentaho mean? Well, we use um, uh, Docker and we actually inject kind of a, the Pentaho file into the, into the Docker container. And so in here, if you actually see, there's a number of files that are called KTR files and, and Data Kitchen doesn't generate those. Those are the actual files from your, from the tool that you use and Pento happens to use a KTR file. And so we kind of treat your tools as sort of function calls. We inject the code into them. Um, we run it in this case in the process space of the Docker container and then we get the test and log results back. And so, um, what that means is that I'm, I'm running all these technologies and seeing that they that they work. And so this is running, if we look at the orders, the production orders are all running, everything's great. So I need to be able to go in and actually make that change. So how do I do that? Well, I have to create a kitchen. And a kitchen's a place where I work. And so I, have, I go to a kitchen wizard and I, I create a new kitchen uh, based off of production. And for us, a kitchen is an, an important idea because it, it encapsulates a lot of the sort of agile and DevOps principles that, that we talk about. Um, and first as an environment, you need to have a kind of a hardware software environment that's a reflection of your production. You don't want to have different libraries. You want to have, uh, you want to have the same code, same version, uh, even the same data that, or uh, a sample of the data that's in production. You want to have, since the kitchen's a place to work, you want to have that place, but you also want to invite people. You want to be able to have certain recipes and run those recipes without other people seeing. Um, we're a big believer in parameters and controls. Um, we won't talk too much about, about that. And then finally, one of the things that we do is we hide uh, version control from you. Everything's stored in Git, and we do the branching and merging for you. Of course, if you like Git, you can, you can still use it. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and create a kitchen, and I'm going to call it, uh, like my demo set, I'm going to call it Dev Sprint. I'm going to hit next. And I've gotten, I've configured this kitchen wizard to have two functions. One is to actually allow me to create and fire up a new Redshift cluster. That takes about uh, 10 minutes. It's a bit slow. Um, but instead, I'm going to create a schema. So there's an existing server that's out there. I'm going to actually create a, a schema in that 
that running server um, that's a separate place to work. Um, and so, yeah, we have, yeah, we, we try to interact with those tools through Docker or through REST commands or through SSH. Um, and yeah, we, we have a, a bunch of ways that we wrap different tools. And then it, it's also people, some people like to work in, you know, without a tool. We have customers who like to do all their uh, to work in Python. And so they, um, you know, they, they actually do the work and, and we run it in, in, in a Python container. So I guess our, our view of the world is that people who do analytics, data scientists, data engineers, or companies standardize on tools. And so um, it, it, one, of the, one of the options to try and go fast with high quality is just sort of force everyone into one tool. And I just don't think that's reality. It's a, it's a multi-tool, multi-skill multi world, and, and people just love their tools. Yeah, that's true. I've seen data ops tools out there that are trying to be the 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 be all and end all. So one environment to do all of these pipelines and uh, you know from dev to test to production. Uh, so you're taking the um, I guess the heterogeneous approach. It, now it may take a little time to set your environment up. I would imagine to establish the connections and APIs with all these tools. But once it's set up, then you can orchestrate it. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, about 2005, um, Micah Funderson and I were at a company where we tried to build that Uber tool to do, in essence, data ops by forcing everyone into using our version of ETL and our version of BI. And, you know, it, it's hard to get, it's hard from an engineering standpoint to build something that covers every use case. And you sort of get 80% there and then it gets asymptotically harder and you sort of end up doing all these bags on the side. And so I'm, I'm just not a believer. I, I think there's all sorts of tools out there and, and the amount of innovation that's happening is incredible. And so people should um, be able to use their tools and, and be able to plug them into a platform that allows them to, to go fast and have high quality and innovate. And so kind of going back to this wizard, we, we're creating a kitchen. It's a it's a, a place to do work. So I'm going to pick one recipe um, and I'm going to also have to create some places to do that work. So in uh, Redshift, I'm going to create a schema called Dev Sprint. And in Tableau Online, I'm going to create a project called Dev Sprint. And these are two ways of kind of scoping within two different systems. One's the uh, a Redshift server, and the other one is, is, a, is a Tableau online server. So I hit complete wizard, and what happens beneath the, the system here is, a, is uh, we create a kitchen, we're creating that branch in Git, we're firing up and, and uh, creating that environment to do work. And so that's, um, you know, that, that kitchen is, is, is created. So if I go back to my kitchen list, I can see that I'm in the Dev Sprint kitchen or I'm, the Dev Sprint Kitchen exists, but I'm still working in production. So now I wanna be able to work in my, my place, my, my Dev Sprint Kitchen. So I hit yes. And now I'm working in Dev Sprint. And so everything I do is, is safe. Um, I can make changes, I can run things, um, and there's no chance that I'll break production. And so that's a that's actually a, a really good thing because I, I can't tell you how many people are working in production or they, they have uh, it. And the cloud actually offers a great opportunity given the ephemeral, the idea that you can spin up and spin down resources. It's a, it's a great way to, to apply some flexibility to how your team works. So, um, you know, we're going to invite that data scientist to do some work and, and rather than than kind of showing you the details of how they edit, I'll just show you the results. Well, this data scientist went in and, and created, uh, using a Jupyter notebook, created an actual IPython notebook. Um, and that I, IPython notebook is incorporated as part of our recipe. And you can see here, it's the IPYNB file. But uh, like, uh, like all of our, our things, we're calling it, we're running it in a Docker container, and we're actually making, um, we're passing parameters in, and we have, actually have a secure store called Vault that stores the parameters for you and, and testing against it. So how, uh, how does the data scientist uh, make sure that the, the, the notebook gets into Data Kitchen? Is that their job or someone else's job? Um, you know, in general, we like to think it's their job because it's not that hard to kind of, you know, go into our UI and add the file. Um, and uh, But it, it could also be, you know, it could also be a data ops engineer uh, role. But, you know, we're trying to make it easy enough that a, that a data scientist, because um, that a data scientist doesn't have to know about things like Git and AWS commands and, how to, and um, 
a whole host of other technologies to be able to, they don't have to also be a DevOps engineer to be able to go in and, and, um, and do their work. So um, yeah, but they could also use a command line um, or they could have someone else do it. So I've made these changes, um, they're all set and, and I wanna be able to run them in my kitchen and I, and I can do that. I just have to be able to go in and, and hit something called uh, create order. And then I create order and that actually goes runs in my, my development kitchen and it actually goes in and does, does the work. Um, and that's really good because now I'm able to go in and, and uh, make, make, those, make those changes. And let me just summarize kind of what happened while, while our order runs in the background. So if I look at it, the, the order's running and it takes a, takes a few minutes to, to run in the background. And uh, the, each steps are running, each technology is called. Um, but what we're trying to do here is, is really help um, answer this request. Like how do you handle a VP of marketing that says, I want a customer segmentation and you've got new tools and new technologies to integrate. Well, the first thing is, the obvious thing is you need a place to work and then you need to be able to kind of deploy that into production. And to kind of uh, end the demo and something uh, I'll, I, you know, I, I'll, I could show you in the UI, but hold over time, we can kind of merge it back into production and then that new code would be available the next time it runs. Uh, I, we don't have time to show that in the demo, but the, the last point that we, we really want to make here is that the, the cycle time, sort of just in time, the cycle time, not of how fast your data flows through their system, but how fast your team can actually create and innovate is actually, I think, an important metric for people who lead analytic teams to focus on. So yeah, they can create, there's a lot of tools out there for an individual contributor to do their job, but how fast can your team take that code that those tools uh, create, whether it's a visualization in Tableau or uh, you know, a file in Pentaho and deploy it into production, how fast can they actually make change in the world? That's actually what really matters. And, and innovation, we truly believe, does come through these iterative cycles of having your team do all this work. And actually, from a management perspective, I used to manage software development teams. And I thought it was back in 2000, I thought it was pretty cool that I could get a software development team to ship code every three months. Now, in 2018, I couldn't get a job shipping software every three months because the speed at which you can deploy new code into production is measured in hours or minutes or seconds. And I think that's that uh, change for analytic leaders is happening. Um, right now, uh, there's a lot of people who are happy updating their, their data warehouse every three months, but that's not operating at the, at the speed of business. It's not happening. Your, your company be data driven. So uh, our, our I have a, a question on your scenario here. Uh, I was going to ask about the people part of this, right? You, you talked about the pipeline and the steps through the tools. But who, you know, from a, a role-based perspective, who initiated this pipeline? Uh, and who created the Redshift schema? Who did the transformations in Pentaho? Are these multiple people or one person? You did talk about the data scientist creating the Python code, but were there other yeah. collaborators in this scenario? Yeah, a, a lot of times that there's, you know, there's a data engineer who kind of, uh, actually signs up to kind of be more of a data ops engineer. And they end up kind of setting up the first recipes and saying, okay, here's how we're going to do it. And then there's other data engineers and data scientists or people who do data visualization who kind of join in. Um, and so it's, uh, you know, it's still, uh, it, it's still early, but it tends to be a little bit more technical um, than someone who uses a, uh, you know, someone who uses Tableau. So the, a data engineer or a, a, a data ops engineer or a process focused data scientist have all been kind of signing up to, to, to lead and start, start this going. So all of these people playing these different roles would need to have a license to, to a data kitchen, for example, and then they would have to do their work in Pentaho or Tableau and then register their work in data kitchen so that the data ops engineer could then orchestrate all of that. Is that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or we, we like it, but our, our license model is not seat-based. We, we, so uh, all of those people could have logins and do their work and then be able to kind of run their piece of the puzzle, um, be able to create their own kitchen, work in their own kitchen, um, and then follow a, a, a continuous deployment pro a process to get it out into production. And so, um, you know, once you, if, if your perspective is, that you know, a lot of times analytic teams are 
organizationally separate. There's a data team and a, and a visualization team, but our vision is that everyone, all these different roles can work together uh, in this framework of, of kitchens and recipes and, and, and tasks and orders. And that will help them um, manage through the complexities of multiple tools and multiple people. Great, Chris, thank you so much for a quick peek at uh, Data Kitchen. I learned a bunch uh, and hope uh, everyone out there listening to this did too. All right, thank you much, have a great day.